we started this project back in 2011. I actually recorded the entire series like five years ago and then realized it was kind of terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ever since then, I've been keeping, we've been keeping notes on how to improve the, the workflow, how to use ZBrush. If you're using Maya or Moto or whatever, we just want to figure out the best way to use ZBrush in a pipeline. We wanted this tutorial to be the best it can be. Refining it from recording this time has taken up like three months, I yeah. think now, just refining, 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 getting it to the point where it is the most complete and the most refined workflow video out there. We're basing this on a professional visual effects workflow. There is, this is not just a personal project. This is based around how you do it in production. We start off in Moto by showing how you can model faster in Moto. Moto is a great modeler, but you can optimize it a fair bit just to be a lot faster in general. We show you how to set up hotkeys and um, useful tools, some Pi menus, and all that would just makes your life a lot easier in Moto. And sort of to keep it in line with how Pipeline works in the real world, we start out in Moto doing a base mesh where we get the correct scale. It's a very, very simple base mesh, just boxes. Yeah. That's basically it. It's very simple geometry because we just need scale and position and rotation to be correct. And then we move into uh, ZBrush where we start sculpting the character. We're using Dynamesh for this, just to get the main proportions down. And we talk a lot about sculpting theory, such as you start big, then you move from general to specific. You're not going to get bogged down by details until the very end of the series. No, because like going through the sculpting workflow, like we would do it in a production, it's important not to rush this, you know, not to lay down your details too fast. So it's a very methodical workflow video where we go through, these are the steps, you know, it's not like you have to follow one by one by one, this is the step, but it's important to keep these things in mind, how you start simple, yeah. then develop, 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 and then until you can finalize your scope. That's a good point to bring up because this is not a step-by-step -step video. We do cover everything, but the point here is not for you to have this result as your final product. You can do that, but the point here is that you should be able to create a hundred or a thousand characters with this method in mind. And that's the important bit in this video here. After that, we talk a little bit about retopology, both how it works in ZBrush what ZBrush's auto retopology is good for. Using zero measure. Exactly, and how we would use, which object we would use this on, which objects we wouldn't use this on, and where we would use something like traditional modeling to retopologize, which we do in Modo on something like the face where yeah. loops around the eyes and mouth is really, really important for animation. So we go very in depth in the retopology chapter, which is about two and a half hours of, uh, of retopology, which is all in real time. We, we utilize the powerful uh, tools in Moto for Retopo. And if you're following along from different application, the principles are applicable. We just happen to use Moto for this. If you're using anything else, the, the techniques are useful for that as well. Yeah, theory is pretty universal. Yeah. It's, you know, Maya, Max, XSI, whatever you wanted to use. Yeah. Maybe not XSI anymore, <laughs> but some people do. Yeah. Uh, these are all applicable. So whatever you're doing, it can be hard sometimes to to think, okay, this is for Moto, so we can only model this in Moto, but modeling is modeling. Yeah. So whichever software you use, this workflow video will definitely be useful. And we get very clean topology at the end of this chapter. And the reason we want clean topology is because every single department down the line after you, such as uh, cloth effects, F regular effects, whatever texturing, everything is dependent on good topology. And once that's done, we uh, take this into uh, ZBrush again, and we start to refine it. We reproject the details from a former sculpt onto our new retopologized version. We show you how to do that in a clean and methodical manner using uh, the projection tool and morph brushes and layers. This is a method which works every time, and it's very reliable. And one of the important parts in these chapters, when you're going between Moto and ZBrush, is really the core of this tutorial is to keep everything clean and consistent so you yeah. can reproject and recreate these steps every single time. Because yeah. that's one of the problems that a lot of people have with ZBrush is sometimes they'll put, you know, they'll get their mesh into ZBrush and the scale will be all messed up and you don't yeah. know why. And the way that we work, it's a very methodical way, but you kind of have to be this way with ZBrush to make sure that it's consistent every single time. This is applicable for literally any kind of asset where you're involving ZBrush. This is not just for characters. We are creating a character here and we'll go into some specifics regarding characters such as sculpting, but regarding pipeline, 
everything we talk about here is directly applicable to any other asset you would create in ZBrush. Following that, we start up with UVs. And UVs is, it's a huge subject. Yeah. It's a simple subject when you get down to it, but it can be hard to understand in the beginning. We take you through, again, a sort of production proven pipeline where we work with UDIMs and tile DXRs to yeah. really get the most out of your texture space. We show you how to set up motor to, to work with UDIMs, both when it comes to laying out your UVs, but also when it comes to importing the back later on when it comes to rendering. And this is important both for people who are just starting out with 3D, figuring out where do we actually place our cuts on something like a face. Yeah. You know, what's the most uh, efficient layout to have when you're working with a UDIM workflow? And even people who are more advanced will still get a lot out of this because this is what we do every day yeah. in VFX. This is kind of the pipeline that we go through. This is what we live and breathe. And also, if, you're, if you've been outside a game for like some time, maybe you've worked in a more old school pipeline where you don't use 3D painting. There are still people out there who don't use 3D painting. The methodology for UV mapping today and texturing is very different than it was a couple of years ago. So we, can, uh, we don't have to worry too much about where we have seams. We have to worry far more about reducing stretching. So we cover how to use it in a modern production. UVs are the base of the texturing process that we do afterwards, but we don't actually get into proper texturing in this course. Yeah. What we do is something called poly painting. Now, usually we would use something like Mori to do traditional texturing, if you will, but poly painting is what we have and is a good and sort of quick way to show you how to texture your model after it's been UV'd. The advantage of poly painting though, is that you can paint directly on your model and you'll be able to see instantly, you know, the colors and textures yeah. that you apply. It's really good for hand painting. And unlike Mari, it's very fast to get something out. You can very quickly try out different colors and it's really good for general concepting. And we show you how to, how to use that. We go through some color theory and then we show also show how to bake it out and get it out as a proper texture file. And working with textures or poly painting inside of ZBrush has some problems and restrictions as well. Because when we need to get our maps out, this is kind of, this is a subject that can confuse people a lot, especially when it comes to displacement map. Displacement mapping inside of ZBrush is, it's a bit of a tricky task. Because yes. there are so many options and a lot of the time some of them don't really make sense. So one of the things we really want to cover and really like, you know, hammer into your head is like, these are the right settings to use because there is a specific set of settings that will help you get your displacement maps out of ZBrush so they just work every single time. So what we're also providing with a cheat sheet, just a picture, a screenshot of the settings, which you can consult every single time you do this. I mean, we still consult it from time to time yeah. because sometimes you'll have a break in between and you can't always remember what this exact setting do. So it's great for us as well. So regarding displacement, we, we cover what a displacement map is because is, a displacement map is pretty much the bread and butter of this production here. But they also provide a lot of problems because if you don't know exactly what they are, you don't understand what the concept of mid value and tons of stuff related to them. They can be very confusing and can be very hard to set up. But we're showing you a method of working with displacement maps, which is easy, it's reliable, and it works every single time. Yeah, and by following this, you should be able to consistently extract your displacement map from ZBrush and have them work perfectly in any piece of software or exactly. engine. Exactly. We also cover uh, specular roughness, which is a topic a lot of guys don't really know much about today. Formerly, you had to uh, use really fancy spec maps and all that to get your specularity right. But in recent years, we've been switching to more physically based shaders, which uses uh, specular roughness instead of specular amount. If we just briefly talk about what a specular roughness map is and how to create it using poly painting. Then we um, bring all our maps into Nuke. Nuke is an amazing tool for texturing, which a lot of guys also overlook. They consider Nuke to be a compositor. What Nuke is, is just an image editor. And Nuke provides a really good replacement for something like Photoshop. Photoshop can be great, and most of you out there probably know how to work with maps inside of Photoshop. Yeah. The great thing about Nuke, though, is that you can sort of keep it up to date constantly. So when you're rendering out new maps or new files that you want to get into your texturing workflow, Nuke allows you to on the fly replace these maps without having to redo what you already did in Photoshop. Let's say you, you adjusted the levels, you adjusted some of the colors. All of this stuff will be updated automatically in your Nuke script 
when you just replace the files that you have in your folders. Then we take our um, our assets from ZBrush into um, into Moto for final rendering. We show you how to set our, this up in a very clean and production proven manner. And we show how to set up some um, materials and how to set up a basic look dev environment. The look that we're setting up and the shade or shading, if you prefer that term, is is going to be simple here. This is not a tutorial on in-depth shading, but it's gonna work fine for our, our purposes here. And finally, we finish all of this off by collecting what we've done in all of the other chapters, and then we go into Photoshop this time. Photoshop is really just a nice tool for just enhancing your final render. Exactly. We can do tons of overpainting, effects, enhance colors, do the background, and really like art direct the way we want our image to look. Oftentimes, Photoshop can be overlooked for something like this, but it's just the final piece of software to just give that special touch to your image.